So now the speaker hitting the stage is the uh, final speaker, Davy Ben Susan. Davy is a software engineer and Rose developer. And uh, David is going to teach us about how to collect data from robots for further analysis later. Data collection from robots is going to become more and more important as the robots get deployed everywhere. So I think that is very important that we pay attention to this presentation, the last presentation of the conference, and in order to learn how to, to do it properly. And David, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent, are you ready then, right? Share your screen. Can we see his screen? Yes. Data collection for robotics, an overview. Uh, the stage is all yours, David. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, the presentation uh, that I'm gonna do today is a bit uh, long, so there will be some steps that I will um, not go into detail so much, um, but the presentation is there, the code is open source. So um, if there are details, you have questions, create an issue, ping me, send me an email, whatever. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's go down to it. Um, first, I'm gonna talk a bit about myself and why I'm here today. Um, so I studied computer science, like probably most of you here. And then I was a software engineer at Synapticon, a company in Stuttgart, in Germany, working on autonomous projects. I was doing a bit of everything uh, there, from the basic of the system to, to data. Uh, that was the, where the journey started. And then I co-founded the startup with a friend and where we needed to collect data. And the framework that I have today is kind of a result of, of practice that I needed to do with customers at the time and um, and let's say a better understanding of the product of how to deliver a product and what customers care about. They want a robot working, but they also want to analyze the data of this robot. They also want to understand what can we do with this robot on top of just operation. So for that, um, just an overview, really an introduction to, to the talk, What, why we do data collection. We want to monitor performance, diagnose faults. We want to do some machine learning on it to improve the performance behavior. Um, we want to do uh, another very important topic is predictive maintenance. We want to know when a problem is going to arise before it happens. and improving processes so in warehouses in logistics it's extremely important and um, they want to understand uh, what is happening uh, in some areas of course the warehouse can be designed perfectly but in many situations um, there are improvements to be done in the path of the robot that is being taken in um, understanding issues where the robot is slowed down why um, how many packages have been scanned? Where are they? Um, is there something lost? We need to collect all of this data. And nowadays we collect, we tend to collect terabytes and terabytes of data. Um, if I'm correct, some companies uh, like Locus are having a 40 terabyte hard drive on their robot and they are right to do so. So what I want to do today is work with you on the framework that I started working on that allows to collect data in a more dynamic way, uh, maybe more um, energy efficient on the con collect what we need and when we need it. So something more universal. Um, there are many good existing projects, uh, not open source. So you have the energy robotics platform, which is really um, can get your data, you have a dashboard, it, it looks really good, the Foxglove also, and the Roboto, they are just closed source, so it's not easy to get started with that. And um, if you're a company that really need it, of course, it's a, it's a possible, but if you're a researcher or starting your company, um, you need something, let's say, to get started with, and that's where uh, my project comes in. 
So what did I do? I developed a data collection framework that is based on plugin lib. So we can enable which plugin we want to, to, to have to collect the data. And all of this data at the end needs to be sent to a dashboard. That is the, let's say the standard way uh, for most, most companies, either a dashboard or a database or a data storage just to analyze or display or both first analyze and display. So the approach is really modular. We can enable the inputs we want to collect, where we want to send it. Um, we can also customize the validation of the data. So it has some JSON schemas. We can really analyze properly and validate uh, on top of the standard ROS message validation. Um, it's very easy to ex extend, uh, adding, um, let's say inputs and outputs is very easy. It's a matter of writing uh, two C++ file. Um, it's flexible. We can enable conditions when we want to collect, when we want to stop. Um, and all of this is really decoupled from each other. We can trigger the data collection also in some events. Um, then we can inspect the data that we collected. So for example, if we are uh, if we have cameras and we really want to count QR codes, analyze the spot of the QR code, where it is um, for warehouse, for example, logistics, it's really something we need. This is an example of analysis. Uh, in the future, I plan also um, recognition of people, for example, to just have a, a counting or also um, recognition of some other objects. Uh, for example, earlier I mentioned uh, energy robotics. They have um, very good analysis of data to understand when, for example, a pipe has a problem. So this is something that could be included, but uh, or that you could include. It's modular. It's made for that. Um, another thing is that it's completely um, it's really efficient in a way that there is only one module imported, let's say out of ROS, which is Fluent Bit. And Fluent Bit uh, is already really fast and very efficient. So it's made for really low level, uh, let's say embedded platforms. It's made uh, in C and Lua, so really low level. And so what does Fluent bring? Fluent Bit brings also? Um, every two, three weeks, I see a blog article, how to collect data from ROS and send it to, let's say, Elasticsearch, how to send it to MySQL, how to send it to whatever. Um, the difference with this framework is that, and thanks to frame bit, is that you can send the data anywhere you want um, with the outputs available from Fluent Bit. On top of it, we can add hours, and this is what I did in my project. I added some, for example, some destination or some inputs. Um, you have many interfaces uh, you have in C, in Go language. Um, the advantage of, for example, the Go language was to use uh, some, let's say, third party APIs. If you need to deal with some servers and their API client is not available in C, you have the choice. Fluent Bit is adding more and more languages, for example, Rust. So at the end, all of this is loaded uh, by plugin lib. Uh, it's completely, let's say, transparent for the user. We don't need to worry. And it's sent. So yeah, it has many advantages. And yeah, it's open source. I think this is the difference with many others. And now we can get started. So what are we going to do today? We are going to run the standard NAV2 demonstration, uh, the turtle bot. And we are going to collect images and uh, going to collect some other data, such as the speed of the robot, the position, um, let's say system data. And all of this will be sent uh, to a database and to Mini.io, which is an image storage. So we are going to really collect images and time series. And all of this, at the end, configurable in a ROS launch file, um, nothing more. Uh, than that, no long scripts. So yeah, let's get started. 
Um, at the moment, what I would require from you is to open five terminal tabs. So one for Firefox, one for Mini.io, one for uh, the navigation um, tool, for the navigation and one for the demo using the inspection. So the robot will go at some places in the map and continue constantly to do this back and forth. It's just to simulate the navigation and then we will run the data collection uh, framework. So on my side, I already did. You go on your terminal and you, you double click if you want to assign a name. Sorry, you click once, you can type and we will do it uh, together then. So Firefox, Mini.io, nav to nav nav to inspection and DC. The names are there. All right. So now that it is done, we are going to start Firefox. So another uh, thing, really, there will be some copy and paste. Um, the most important to understand is that all of this copy and paste is to set up the infrastructure, the images, the data, they need to be stored somewhere. And because of that, uh, there is some infrastructure to set up once. Once this is set up, then you don't need to, to do it again. But because we have today the presentation with everything, we are going to run everything uh, together. All right. So feel free to, to, to come back later to the project and to, to ask me or to ask me how to, to do things. And in the meantime, we are going to, to run it. So we're gonna start Firefox. It's gonna open three tabs. All right, this is getting started. Let's see if it runs. So this was tested, don't worry. We tested with uh, Ricardo multiple times, but- Let's cross fingers. The, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will just try to close it again on my side and uh, maybe do a control C and try again. All right, it was just a tiny bug and now now we have many windows. You should have only three, just that you know. You should have one with 9,000, one with Adminer, one with 8502. So um, I'm going to just reorder. Yeah, try again. Three of them. Yeah, try again. No, yeah, and try again if it's fading on your side. But you see for me, 9,000, Adminer, 8502. So nothing is loading at the moment. It is normal. It is uh, simply because the services are not started, we are going to start them together. So now we go back to the ROSJECT. I'm gonna put this in the background. All right. So um, packages are uh, ready, but we are going to uh, verify it. So now we go to the terminal mini-io. You see it's mentioned here, terminal mini-io, so I switch. I do copy, paste, copy, paste. Yeah. Or not. Okay. If it's not working with the button, for some reason, for me, it's not, you see. Okay, it works sometimes. If it's not working, just select the text. And the reason we go with sudo in this particular case is that there was uh, a bug from, from uh, my repo that uh, I've managed to solve. 
uh, ready recently, but at the time we prepared the presentation, it was not uh, yet understood what was happening. So we are not going to break the system, no worries. So we install some dependencies. All of this is also explained in the in the repository. In the ROSJECT, the project has already been built, but um, we do all those steps just that you see for the future when you will get your, when you, when you will want to work on it, uh, you know how to, to do it. All right, so all required ROSJECT installed successfully. Now we are going to rebuild the workspace which should be extremely fast because it was already built in the past. Maybe one of the dependencies updated and in this case, it might take a while, uh, but still should be fast enough. And maybe until uh, this is built, I can explain some more about the framework. Um, really, its trend relies on, is it really in the fact that changing, uh, setting it up may take uh, minutes because of the example and the documentation. Um, so for example, if you have an elastic search, um, server or you have PostgreSQL or you have S3, for example, um, all of this is just a matter of configuration in a YAML file. Uh, basically, most of my plugins uh, are wrappers around Fluentbit that allow to pass the configuration directly to Fluentbit. That is, um, that, I'll say, provides a C API. So at the end, whatever you use, you will just have some configuration to change, but nothing really to, 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 to do on the low level part. And it's important, it's very important because you are mostly roboticists um, and I can imagine not, that not everyone knows how to handle uh, databases and uh, let's say the system part. So this, um, let's say, is already transparent to you. So most of the infrastructure uh, will be quite straightforward to install. In the repository on the latest versions, I also started adding some scripts. So for example, install MiniIO, install uh, Postgre, install all the tools. Uh, that are needed. So the idea is really first to have all roboticists able to ignore this challenge of infrastructure that is often the case uh, that we have. And also on the other hand, uh, we have backend developers who want to provide an API. They know how to do the API, but they don't know how to start a robot and know how to collect data. So the goal is to have it easy also for them. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a challenge to have everyone happy, which is really hard in general, but uh, let's try. Um, so now it's building one of the latest package. It should be almost done. Sorry for this inconvenience. All right. So now we have uh, some pip. 
So pip is a Python package manager, and we are going to install um, some dependencies. Um, some of them are needed now, some of them are, let's say, on top. They are used mostly for the back end and the front end. I'm using some really simple tool to display the data at the moment called Streamlit. It's an open source tool. You can create your dashboard very fast. But this is just an example. For example, I have another demo in my repository on how to display the same exact data with Grafana. So whatever your need at the end, you have an abstraction on how to collect the data, how to display the data, how to get the data. Um, this shouldn't be uh, blocking you. It's just a matter of configuration. Um, so let's see where it leads. All right, it seems to be done. Now that we prepare the packages, um, we are going to set up the environment. So the environment we are going to, we are still in the terminal MiniIO. So we are going to start the MiniIO server. So CD, we are already there actually. And now we are going to start the MiniIO server. MiniIO, as I mentioned earlier, is really used to store the images, the files, whatever we want to send that is not a time series. So now we go to Firefox. So we come back to the window we opened earlier. And I forgot to read which port it is on the 9000. So we go here and here. So we reload and now it's going to be loading. The credentials are MiniIO admin and again MiniIO admin. So to not make a mistake, I copy here and I paste it here. And I save. So now we are in the object storage. It's similar to S3 for those who use it. We don't need to go through all of this today. We are going to simply create an access key that we will use to log in later on. So if you look at the ROS object, it's mentioned access the access key. On the left, click on create access key. Then we need to take note of them and we will replace it in the configuration of uh, the data collection. Just that you know, it's uh, just two string, one short, one a bit longer. So I'm gonna first copy in the code editor, which is here. I'm gonna open it and I'm gonna show you exactly where it is. You should basically replace the variables existing where it says access key ID, you put your access key ID. In the secret access key, you put the secret access key. So, as I mentioned, so home user ROS2 simulation software. So, we go here, source ROS2 data collection, DC demos, params, and TB3 simulation, PGSQL mini IO. Those are the two places. So how do I modify the data? I go in here, I look for the access key ID. So this is one. So a trick to make it simpler for everyone, what you do, you do a control H, it's gonna show you this and you replace with the new string. And you see it has two mentions. So then you do replace all. Okay, so this is the access key ID. Now we are going to change the other one. So I go back to uh, Firefox. I select this one, I control C. And now I do the same with the secret access key. Control H. And I replace control V. All right, then make sure to save it. I press Control S, and then very important, here we didn't create it yet, we need to really click on Create. At this moment, it says write it down because you will not get it later. In our case, it's fine, it's in the file, we don't need to worry anymore. Now, if you really want to download, it's gonna download it as you want. Then we close, it's mentioned here, MiniIO is set up, perfect. Then, 
this is what we see. If you want later to take a look, it's ready. Now we go to the PostgreSQL setup. And for that, we go to the nav to nav. I'm reusing the windows, otherwise we would have really many. Uh, just that you know, all this infrastructure, once again, once it's set up one time, you don't need to do it again. So, okay, let's go with PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL is really a time series database. It's going to store your events at precise time. Then uh, for the rest, uh, yeah, you don't need to worry about it. Postgre on this project was already installed. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. And what we are going to do is just to start it and configure it. So here we go. We create a user called DC. We create a database also called DC. We put a password in this user, which is password. And we have this actor rule to say this is fine. Um, then we are going to set up adminer. So adminer is just a tool to to um, to visualize uh, the database. One thing that I see that I made a mistake, this requires sudo. So here, for every, anyone, this is sudo on the LM step. Then I restart Apache. Uh, you don't need to understand everything, really. This is not the, the part that is the most important. Now that is set up, we go back to Firefox to the adminer window. So here, notice that it opened with HTTPS, which we don't want. And we see it. So this is exactly it. So server, I will copy localhost. I will type it localhost double dot five four three two five four three two. Ah, uh, for sorry, we need, also need to select PostgreSQL. This is not a mandatory step for the setup. This is a, a tool that you will use for debugging most likely. Oh. And here we just have the information that the table where the data will be stored exists. We don't need more than that. This means everything was fine. If you don't see this, um, you might have missed a step. Um, but this is enough to verify everything is fine. And later on with this tool, if you want, you can check the data stored, which is also very nice. All right. Next. Please tell me if uh, you need, uh, if you are blocked or if you need some help on the chat, I'm monitoring it constantly. Far so good. So far so good. Yeah. All right. So now we are going to set up the simulation environment, which is really uh, the usual thing that you guys know the most: how to start Gazebo and uh, and the map, etc. So let's go. Um, we go in here. We source all of this. You're the professional, more than me. All right. So there is some variables to set for Gazebo and Turtlebot. Uh, Turtlebot is needed to start it. I know the norm, the Turtlebot for is new is already available, but at the time it was not yet uh, ready. So why do we set the Gazebo model path and resource path? I believe there is an issue in the Amazon uh, works space or the warehouse. Sorry, the warehouse package and the issue is also linked in the Rosject. So if you have some free time and you want to fix it, uh, feel free. Uh, I did that and it's really welcome. So I set up all the variables just to ensure that the everything will be displayed. So we, we run it. 
10 minutes, David. All right. So Gazebo is running. All right, we can stop it. Um, you need to close the window most likely. Then this is gonna stop, everything good. Then we will start the navigation. So, this will start uh, Gazebo, the map on Airbnb really a lot of stuff that you know a lot more. So the environment is there. This is taken from NAF2. I didn't invent anything. It's very important to mention. Thank you so much, Steve, uh, for developing NAF2 and for the support. He has been a great support over the years, even personally sometimes uh, reaching out. So really shout out to him. Um, yeah, so now we have everything. We have the map. Now, what we want to do is to really start the simulation, the autonomous navigation. So we go to the, sorry, for the terminal. We go to the inspection terminal. Um, this is where we are going to start to have the robot moving. And if we go to the graphical tools, we should see it. And also to Gazebo. Mm, not available. So if this happens, please stop the inspection demo. Please stop also Gazebo and the launch pad started in the nav navigation. And we will start it again. It can be that sometimes communication has not been working. So I start it again. And I started also again. The map is not even loading now. So without the map for sure, uh, we cannot navigate. Let's see what's happening. Mm -hmm. Gazebo is properly stopped. Let's try once again. Here the map is fine. All right, so we go once again. It's take not available. So for some reason today the demo demonstration from NAV2 is not running. Did we run this in Cyclone? Did I run it on default on Humble. So yeah, but DDS uh, implementation. Yeah, I mean I use the default uh, Humble DDS, which is uh which is fast DDS. DDS. Yeah, no, I, all of this has been uh, tested uh, with default parameters. So, we will try um, one last time. If not, Ricardo, I suggest that we go through, um, at the end of the project, I have a video of how everything should look like at the end. So, let's say on the storage, on the, the data, on everything. And we just go through that. And this 
I can take a look later on because of the time that's left. At least the users can, the participants can see what should happen at the end. What do you think? Well, well, can you try to change to Cyclone DDS implementation, changing the variable? Um, I don't uh, think uh, we have the comments on the chat how to do it. And Rodrigo has exported, has uh, provided the export mm -hmm. that you have to do. On the chat, you, you have access, right? You told me that you yeah, have yeah, yeah. in the other. So this and start again. Yeah, on each one of the terminals, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Oh, sorry, I missed this. So yeah. here. Okay, and now it's working fine. Okay, I'm not aware of uh, of why, but now we see the robot moving. Okay, yeah. so okay, for some reason on the project, uh, you will need to have a, a cyclone. Oops, excuse me. You will need to have cyclone in a normal situation. Uh, you don't, mm -hmm. but this would be investigated. So, all right, putting things back in order. Okay, so now we come back to here. Uh, we have the robot moving. Now we need to start the data collection and we are almost ready. So we go to the terminal data collection. By the way, thank you, Rodrigo, uh, to say it. Uh, thanks for the support. Very quick. I wish I had some Rodrigo all the time to help me like this. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Um, all right, so why do we need to rebuild? Because we changed the parameter, the YAML parameter, and this needs to be installed. So the build should, this time, be very quick because we just built and we are just changing a YAML type. All right. So meanwhile, the robot is continuously running. Uh, and we don't need to do anything more for sure on your application it's going to move differently not this i already did and we can start it okay so the data collection is being started um, of course if you want to check what's happening people to check here we see for example uh, some data uploading gpg which is an image um, one thing that you can see on the top is which plugins are, are being started, um, how they are check, being started, the data validation is loaded. All right. So I'm going to skip this step because of the time left, but basically you can visualize the data in the GIF. You can see that the data is collected properly. What is, and, and in the in mini IO is the same. You can see that in the bucket, some data is stored which are the images um, we will directly visualize the data from the dashboard um, i realized that we need one more terminal now i that i didn't put in the top part so just create a new one you don't need to put a special name and this we will start the dashboard so what we need to go to do is to export one two variables those are the variables that we set initially. So I go back to the code editor. I take the access key ID. I export it. Now I do the same with the secret key. I copy, I paste. You should be copy paste master at the end of this talk. All right. And now we start Streamlit, which is the dashboard. It's just visualizing the data. It's a front end where and it gets the data from uh, postgre which we started a lot earlier and and mini also so let's see now if i go to so it says it started on port 8502 i go to the graphical tool i go to firefox i make it quite large and i go to this window and i try again All right. 
And here you have the dashboard. Uh, it's an example dashboard. You can make your own. Uh, it's made with Python, this one, but you can do one, as I said, with Grafana, uh, whatever. The front end doesn't matter. The back end doesn't matter with this framework. You just decide which data you want to, to take and you just dump it wherever you want. So for example, in this case, uh, we have um, some data that is collected is this operating system, the kernel, the CPU, memory, the CPU usage over time. And you see this is the date of today. So it's a real demo that is working. Uh, and then the CPU and processes over time. This is really system data. Um, this is why it's in the category system. There is the robot data, which is speed and command velocity over time. Um, with this example, you can, let's say, analyze. This is for personal use, but at the end, whatever you want to collect, you can. It's just a matter of measurement and result. And here, which is uh, what I wanted to, that I mentioned earlier, which is, I think, pretty cool. You can directly visualize the images that are collected. Later on, uh, if you want to inspect your images in the way you want, you have either raw, rotated, inspected, so if you need to rotate the image. Um, in development, this rotated would be transformed and you can apply any transform you want because sometimes the camera on some robot in a warehouse are tilted, sometimes not. So this would be decided, uh, this would be, let's say, pushed later on. Then we have environment section, which is the map. So just for you to visualize the result, you can download it. And infrastructure, this is more, let's say, not for the roboticists, but for your friends who are handling the infrastructure in the company, they want to be sure that the servers are working. So for example, this is mini IO, and this is Postgre. And true means it's working. So all of this is collected from the file. And what I would like to do just before we stop, is going through the file. Um, we don't need to go in detail to everything, but just the most important part. The file is composed in two different sections. You have the measurement server, which says which data is collected. So you have CPU, OS, memory, uptime, and all of this is collected. We have some variables to say um, where the data is saved, where the images are saved, especially. Then all of these at the end are the plugins. So for example, uh, sorry, plugins, yeah. You have measurement plugins and conditions because sometimes you want to filter uh, the data that is collected. So, and after all, all of these are the sections for the plugin. You have the plugin name, the key, so where it's gonna be stored. This is going to be used later for the back end and the front end. And the frequency you can change, for example, the CPU only every 5,000 milliseconds. You put a tag on each input to say where it's going to be sent. And here I just say, send it to Postgre. Um, and then you have some customized parameter that you can just add and or not. Um, then you have, for example, another parameter, which is init max measurement that just says, hey, just pick this data once and then stop collecting because the operating system is not going to change every day. So, um, then you have, yeah, you have those, distance traveled. This is also a very fancy metrics that you see on most websites for, from robot six companies. Our robots travel 5,000 kilometers, 100,000 kilometers. So they have something like this and, and they use it. Uh, command velocity, the command you send, the position of the robot in the map, how often it stops, when, the camera data. Um, so this is the first section. Then the second section, which is the destination server, is starting the destination where it's going to be sent. All the plugins sent the same. Here we want to store the data in PostgreSQL and on MiniIO. And we want to append in each JSON data, we want to add the robot name. So we just say append a robot name called Turtlebot. And we want an ID just to a unique ID of the machine, which is stored here. From a file. Then um, this is not used in this demo, but you have the mini IO configuration, which we changed earlier, and is simply uh, where is the data stored, 
where it's going to be sent and the same for Postgres. So which input we take, we want the CPU, memory, and as you see, Postgres has some inputs, uh, Mini.io has some inputs. Uh, so you really are flexible and you can really tune. You don't need to go through um, how do I send my data to one place or how do I send this exact data to one place. With this framework, uh, which is really under heavy development, you can say, I want this data there, this data there, this data there, but at this frequency, uh, this data there, this frequency with this condition, um, and stop after collecting 10 times the data. You are flexible with the backend tools you have. So if your uh, backend engineers in your startup really knows well Postgres, go with Postgres. If you really knows well Elasticsearch, go with it. At the end, it's just a parameter. So this is it. Um, so that's how to collect data on robots um, di directly into ROS. So you don't, you can do it yourself. That's it. Okay, hey, excellent presentation. Uh, David, thank you very much for it and for all the effort put onto this. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you, David. Okay, now let's go to the Q&A section. Please, attendee, now go to the Q&A tab and post your question there. So we are going to pick the most voted question to ask the speaker. Yes, and now we can see you, David. So, yeah, so I see the first question. Is there an option to capture network DTS traffic information as well as CPU and memory? Um, CPU and memory, uh, I don't know if it's from DDS especially, uh, but though, so DDS information, not yet, but it's a really good addition. I didn't think about it. Um, what I could um, envision is that in the CPU or the memory plugin, we could have an extension saying from a particular process. Okay, and I have another question of myself. In the meantime, there yeah. are people, please remember to put the questions on the section of questions. And um, uh, my question is about the performance, because what I would like to know if, if you have done any, any tests about how introducing all these uh, data collection systems uh, affects the performance of the robotic system itself. So the nice thing is that um, the architecture is done in a way that you have plugins. So you load whatever you want. So it has a very small footprint. And the back end of this whole framework is ROS with messages. Mm -hmm. And um, Fluentbit. Fluentbit is a really low footprint. I, I don't know if there is lower footprint than this. So that's actually one of the reasons that I went with it. It's a flexible and low footprint. And they, they really put it on very small devices. It's for IoT. So it's really for limited devices. Um, another part of the answer is also that you don't need uh, to collect the framework completely on your on your robot. So for example, in some use cases, in some warehouses, for example, you have uh, one device that is going to collect the data that is not running on the robot. So the robot might uh, send, for example, some custom information like CPU and memory or some specific data. But let's say you can also tune so that most of the work is done by a third party computer. Um, the but the complete answer is that those tests about let's say uh, limitations need to be done 100 percent but uh, it's uh, a young project from some months ago and at the moment i'm the uh, let's say sole contributor and i really welcome uh, this um just a note um yeah this is going to be improved over time and i really envision to have this as a let's say a one stop project for future prototyping at least i know that I, i'm quite sure that all the premium uh, solutions that are really mature from foxglove roboto and energy robotics are really well thought um, and maybe 
would, would fit for more, let's say, um, bigger organizations. But I think for a small company who just gets started and wants to show the data to their customer, mm. um, it would be a good start, at least. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. A, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. And um, um, there, is, uh, there are some other questions there, but let me ask you another one of myself yet so the people mm -hmm. can also put more questions. Actually, well, don't have so much time for questions, <laughs> but let me ask you this one. It's about uh, data protection. So the, the, the aim is to capture this data and put it into a database. And then have you, take in, have you taken into account data protection because the robots are capturing uh, images or data of whatever that may be for the owner of the robot is very important uh, and it cannot be spread around the world. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So most of this work is, let's say, more system related. So if you want to limit, for example, where you can send the data, you normally what you do is that you are going to send from the robot to an endpoint, which is, for example, you have a database, which is your PC, uh, not on the robot. Mm. And this is going to be sent. Of course, if you intercept the traffic, you might uh, Let's say at the end, all of this data is going through ROS. So um, maybe that's a question for the ROS community. How do we um, uh, ensure that this is protected? With in secure a way, ROS, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Put you in have another layer ROS. of secure ROS too? Yeah, this is possible. And I know, for example, for, let's say, bigger companies, you have Alias Robotics, who is uh, working solely on robotic security uh, but i think this is not really in the scope of the project because um, at the end uh, the way to do the security um, let's say is uh, uh, very important but also uh, let's say it's uh, like it's an abstraction a... it's another thing but i agree with you and it's a very good idea i think i will add a section uh, on the documentation about secure ROS. Okay. Okay. okay, great. Then let me ask you the qu last question here. And then it says, it can, it's by Roberto Sakers that says, um, can this data be accessed and shared by the whole team? So, yes. So for example, at the moment, I run everything on the same machine, whether it's the simulation or the, the back end, front end, etc. But you could have all of these, let's say, tools that I set up on a different machine. And then the robot can collect all the data. And let's say the destination where you're going to send the data is just going to be a different IP. So if you, if you want, uh, it's just a matter of configuration in the YAML. Okay, so there's still uh, another question, but uh, we are already late on time. So I think that we are going to finish the presentation here and thank you again for your presentation and the topic, the interesting topic that you presented. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, David. So uh, attending, don't forget to read to this presentation because at the end of the conference after the Rose Award ceremony, we are going to announce the best speaker of this Rose Developers Day. So take a moment and read this speech by David right now. I did it. <laughs> Great. And uh, guys, next? yeah, so what is happening now <laughs> is that we are going to transition to the last part of the conference, which is the Ross Awards Ceremony. And But before going into that, I would like you to share with you a link to a quick, um, a quick uh, questionnaire where you can express your opinion about the conference. So you can rate how you have experienced the conference, how you like it, you don't like it, whatever, any comment. is is a short conference that you, uh, sorry, a short uh, uh, questionnaire that you can do while we are waiting for starting the Ross Awards ceremony. So let me share on, on this on the chat, okay? What else? Yeah, on please take a moment and tell us your opinion because it's so important for us. And so finally, dear Rose developers, all presentation have been done. 
And I would like to thank to all speakers for your wonderful presentation. Let's have a big applause for all the speakers. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah. Really, those presentations, they took a lot of work. You don't know how much because, uh, as we mentioned from the very beginning of the conference, those presentations are based on practice, not on a slide, showing you a slide and talking. And that requires a lot of work. So I, I know how much those, all the speakers, they have worked yeah. on this. And, and thank you very much for the effort. Thank you.